I don't know about you, but it's been pretty hard to be optimistic this year. Can we buck up just enough to see the world won't fall apart? Maybe this year we'll decide we're not giving up before we try. This year we'll make a new start. 2020's been quite a year so far, hasn't it? Hey, does anyone have a map for how to do this? Does anybody have a map? Anybody happen to know how the hell to do this? I don't know if you can tell, but this is me just pretending to know. So where's the map? I need a clue. Cause the scary truth is I'm flying blind. And I'm making this up as I go. May God give us the strength and hope to endure these uncertain times. Does anybody have a map? Anybody happen to know how the hell to do this? I don't know if you can tell, but this is me just pretending to know. So where's the map? I need a clue, because the scary truth is I'm flying blind. And I'm making this up as I go. We're all making this up as we go along, but may we find peace and comfort in the arms of our loving God, and may the peace of Christ be always with you, and also with you. Friends, let's sing together. You know, every week we come to this table and acknowledge each other as children of God, and we hear that we are loved as we are. No one deserves to be forgotten. No one deserves to fade away. No one should come and go and have no one know he was ever even here. No one deserves to disappear, to disappear. And so we hear that Jesus broke bread and that Jesus poured wine, and he gave it to his friends, telling them, telling us that we matter, and that whenever we share this meal, he is here with us. Even if you've always been that barely in the background kind of guy, you still matter. And you have a place at this table. Don't you flicker out and have any doubt that they're never even here. No one deserves to disappear. To disappear. Ooh. Have you ever felt like nobody was there? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear? Like you could fall and no one would hear? Ooh. 
let that lonely feeling wash away. Cause maybe there's a reason to believe you'll be okay. Cause when you don't feel strong enough to stand, well you can reach, reach out your hand. And oh, someone will come running, and I know we'll take you home. Cause even when the dark comes crashing through, when you need a friend to carry you, when you're broken on the ground, you will be found. So let the sun come streaming in, cause you'll reach up and you'll rise again. If you only look around, you will be found. 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 A, a, reading fr a reading from Gospel of Luke. Hear what God's Spirit says to you. Now all the tax collector collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So hold them this parable. Which one of you have hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together with his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who, do not, who need no repentance. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp sweeping the house and searching carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I have found my coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is a joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Here ends the reading of words that give us insight on God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Say amen. 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 Say it again. Hansen. Today is going to be an amazing day, and here's why. Because today, all you have to do is just be yourself. Uh, but also confident, that's important, and interesting, easy to talk to, approachable, but mostly be, be yourself. That's the number one, that's the most important thing. Be yourself, be true to yourself. Also, though, uh, don't worry about whether your hands are going to get sweaty for no reason and you can't make it stop no matter what you do because they're not going to get sweaty. So I don't even know why you're bringing it up because it's not going to happen because you're just, all you have to do is be yourself. You know, I'm not even going to worry about it, though, because seriously, it's not like it's, like it's going to be that time where you had the perfect chance to introduce yourself to Zoe Murphy after the jazz band concert last year when you waited afterward to talk to her and tell her how good she was, and you were going to pretend to be super casual, like you didn't even know her name, and you'd introduce yourself, and you'd be like, wait, wait, sorry, I didn't hear you. Chloe? Did you say your name was Chloe? And then she'd be like, no, it's Zoe. I, I said Zoe. And you'd be like, oh, see, I thought you said Chloe because I didn't even, I'm very busy with other stuff right now. That's the thing. But 
you didn't even end up saying anything to her anyway because you were scared that your hands were sweaty, which they weren't that sweaty until you started worrying that they were sweaty, uh, which is what made them sweaty. So you put them under the hand dryer in the bathroom, so now they weren't sweaty, they were just very warm now as well. Dear Evan Hansen is a musical about two teens who barely knew each other, and yet their lives became intimately intertwined. Have you seen it? High school can be a very difficult time for people, and it certainly was for these two high school students, Evan Hansen and Connor Murphy. Evan had severe social anxiety and no self-confidence to speak of, not any real friends. And he was given one assignment from his therapist to write a letter to himself each day about why that day was going to be a good day. You see, if he believed that having a good day was possible, then it might just happen. Connor Murphy was a social outcast. He had difficulty with his sister, Zoe Murphy, and his parents. He didn't have friends at school either. The two only interacted twice. The first was when Connor saw Evan and perceived his social anxiety as making fun of him. And so Connor pushed Evan down the hallway. Connor's sister, Zoe, went to check and make sure that Evan was okay, but Evan was obsessed with Zoe, and because of his social anxiety, he could hardly get a syllable out. The second time that Connor and Evan interacted was later that same day when Evan went to the computer lab to write his second letter. Dear Evan Hansen, it turns out it wasn't an amazing day after all. This isn't going to be an amazing week or an amazing year because why would it? Oh, I know, because there's Zoe and all my hope is pinned on Zoe, who I don't even know. And who doesn't know me? But maybe, maybe if I did, maybe I could just talk to her, then, then maybe, maybe nothing would be different at all. I wish that everything was different. I wish that I was a part of, of something. I wish that anything I said mattered to anyone. I mean, face it, would anyone even notice if I just disappeared tomorrow? Sincerely, your best and most dearest friend, me. Evan prints off his letter in the computer lab, and there's only one other student in there, Connor Murphy. Connor stands up, and he takes Evan by the hand, and he sees his empty cast, and he signs his name in large letters across it. He says social outcasts have to stick together. But then Connor looks over and he sees the letter that Evan has just printed and notices his sister's name is on it. And he becomes furious, thinking once again that Evan is making fun of him. And he leaves in a rage. Evan begins to, to freak out, wondering what on earth Connor might be doing with that letter. Is he going to show Zoe? Is he going to show his parents? What's he going to do? And Evan obsesses over that for days. A few days later, Evan is called into the principal's office where the Murphys, Connor and Zoe's parents, are waiting for him. He, of course, begins to have a panic attack, wondering why they're there. But the Murphys say that a few days earlier, their son Connor had died by suicide. And the only thing that he had on him was Evan's letter to himself. 
But since it was addressed, Dear Evan Hansen, and signed, Sincerely Me, the Murphys assume that Connor and Evan had been great friends and that it is a suicide note that Connor has written to Evan. Now, Evan tries to set the record straight, but with his social anxiety, he can't do it. Plus, as he tries to deny that he really didn't even, he, he tries to deny that he even knew Connor, but it's hard because Connor's name is written in large letters across his cast. So Evan agrees to have dinner with the Murphys, and Evan's family friend, Jared, Jared is very clear that he's not Evan's friend, he's just a friend of the family. Jared tells him that he ought to just smile and nod along. Evan tries that, but he's so awkward that he ends up telling the Murphys that he and Connor have been secret friends for a long time, and even tells them that there is a whole series of email exchanges that he promises to print off for them. So Evan goes back to family friend Jared, and they create a fake email account for Connor, and they create the exchange and backdate the emails, which Evan then prints off and gives to the Murphys. Now at this time, Evan begins to realize that the Murphys need to believe that Connor had a friend and that he had something good going on in his life, plus... Evan has a family situation that isn't exactly ideal either. His mother is splitting her time between work and college classes. His dad has moved to Colorado with a new family. And he recognizes that he needs the Murphys too. And it doesn't hurt that he gets to spend quite a bit of time with Zoe. As time goes on, Evan and a classmate realize that people are forgetting Connor. They're beginning to forget what had even happened. And so they decide to hold a memorial service where people can share their memories of Connor. And they start the Connor Project so that people won't feel alone. With Mrs. Murphy's encouragement, Evan decides to speak at the memorial service. He's, of course, flustered and nervous but the speech is recorded and it goes viral. The Connor Project then decides to raise money for an orchard that has been closed, which Evan has told everyone he and Connor used to frequent. As you can imagine, Evan only digs himself in deeper from there, especially as he begins a romantic relationship with Zoe Murphy. One of the central themes of the Bible is being lost and then being found. It's something that we read throughout the Bible, but we find special cases of it here in Luke chapter 15. There are three parables, in fact, about something that is lost being found. We heard two of them just a moment ago. One is about the lost sheep, the other about the lost coin, and the third one we didn't read because it's considerably longer, but it's probably familiar to you, the parable of the prodigal son. In each of these cases, there is something that is lost, God rejoicing in it being found, and then repentance. Now, this is how the story starts. Jesus is sitting down at the table with sinners and tax collectors. And this is an important theme throughout the Gospels, but particularly in the Gospel of Luke, that Jesus uses the table as a way to break down social barriers. It happens over and over again. In fact, in the previous chapter, Jesus has just talked about how God's banquet table has an ever-expanding guest list. How those who are, who are living in poverty, who suffer from mental or physical disabilities, are welcome at the table. And so, this is expanding upon that, and indeed, each of these parables ends with a feast. So, Jesus is sitting at this table with sinners and tax collectors, and 
the self-righteous religious folks of the day came up and said, Jesus, why are you sitting with these people? They don't deserve to be at the table with you. And in all fairness, we don't know what the sinners had done, but we know what the tax collectors had done. They were in league with the Roman Empire. They collected all the taxes. And they also often collected more than they were supposed to to keep for themselves. And so they took from their own people and took from people who were living in poverty. So we knew that they were not particularly popular people. It's understandable why they would question Jesus hanging out with them. But notice this. They, they frame this in terms of sin. Why are you hanging out with these people who have done something wrong? But in the parables, that's not the way that Jesus responds to their question. Not in terms of what they have done wrong. Instead, in each of these parables, there is a pattern. Lost, found and rejoicing, repenting. But I think that understanding what some of these words mean in Greek can help us really understand what's happening here. For instance, the word lost in Greek doesn't just mean not being able to find something or someone or not knowing where you are. I'm lost. The Greek word also carries with it a connotation of impending peril and doom, destruction. Okay, so someone is in the midst of peril, of great destruction around them. And in the midst of that, God seeks them out and finds them and simply rejoices in finding them. And then there is repentance. But that word that we translate in English as repentance, in Greek is metanoia. And that word metanoia doesn't mean so much apologizing for something that you've done wrong as it does a change of heart, mind, and spirit. A sense of clarity. A sense of purpose. So you see what's happening here? Someone is in the midst of great peril, catastrophe, chaos. God finds them, brings them comfort and peace and rejoices in that. And that leads to a different way of seeing the world. I think that if we had to sum up the parables that we find in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15 with a hashtag, the hashtag from Dear Evan Hansen would work perfectly. Hashtag, you will be found. It's exactly what these parables are about. God finding those who are in the midst of chaos, bringing them peace and comfort that leads to a transformed way of seeing the world. It's about moving towards wholeness and feeling found. That, of course, is the core point of Dear Evan Hansen. By the end of the show, Evan has to come clean about not really being friends with Connor. And not everything ends up all happy and in a neat bow. But the characters do discover that through Evan's actions, they have felt found and moved towards healing and even a bit of wholeness. That's really a powerful message, realizing that we're in life together and that we're moving towards a, a more sense of, of healing and wholeness, that we are better when we are bound in life together, that no one ought to disappear, that no one ought to feel alone, that no one ought to feel like they are just waving through a window at the world like Evan Hansen felt. That is also the message of the gospel, that we are called to, to be that sense of community for each other, that we are called to live that way in the world. We, of course, rejoice in God finding us in, sense, in a, a place of chaos or 
or peril and bringing us to a place of wholeness, but there are things that we can do to let go of those chaotic places in our lives as well. When we let go of bitterness, when we let go of greed or resentment or despair or hatred, we help to move our own hearts towards wholeness. And indeed, God rejoices. May we continue to strive towards wholeness this day and each day. May it be so. Amen. Friends, when we get discouraged, let us remember that God has promised to be with us always. Let us remember that Jesus has promised that God will seek us out like a sheep lost in the wilderness. Let us remember that God's spirit empowers and emboldens us.